purpose of this video is to show you how to do, or at least get started in, the individual mini tab assignment. We're particularly going to focus on the mini tab part of the mini tab assignment for this video. Um, tasks and assignments is where you can find the individual mini tab assignment. And if you're in my face to face course, you won't have the deep dive discussion links here. Um, but if you're in my online class, you'll have to scroll past them to see both the mini tab folder and the individual mini tab assignment. Um, so both of these folders are really the individual mini tab assignment. One of them has an earlier due date um, and it's for completing just the mini tab portion of the mini tab assignment. And then the second assignment is for the report part of the uh, individual mini tab assignment. And we'll, we'll focus more on the mini tab part this time. Um, the report part is going to be you submitting to me something in Microsoft Word that has copies of all of the relevant stuff that you've done in Minitab, but it's organized um, in a Word file. Uh, for both of these, you want to get started with this um, file right here. And so I downloaded, and you can see it downloading to my tray. And I've downloaded it several times, which is why we've got the, the parentheses added to it. Um, but that's okay, we're going to get rid of those when we uh, open it up here in a second. And then if you want to read the instructions, which you absolutely should in addition to this video, um, then you should click on either one of them have um, the instructions. Uh, this one's a little more catered to when you're doing the mini tab stuff. And then the other set of instructions is a little more catered to when you're doing the report stuff, but both of them have the essential instructions there. Um, the stuff that is colored are going to be the stuff that's most important to not only passing the course, but also to getting credit for this particular assignment. Um, so I would even read the colored stuff twice at least um, when you're reading through the instructions. So these are the general instructions and then a picture to show you um, what we're going to do at the beginning in our mini tab file. And then um, you have specific things that I'm going to be looking for in the assignments. And these um, should be, uh, should have their counterparts in the mini tab file. So our real goal is to, to write the report and have all these answered in the report. But we should be getting our answers for all of these from the mini tab file. And so I'm going to show you how to get answers from the mini tab file. Um, using Minitab today. Um, so we've already got our files downloaded. Um, by the way, if you keep scrolling, you can see the rubric too. And the rubric's how I'm gonna grade you. And basically, I'm just gonna grade every single one um, based on uh, whether you've done everything that was asked in these numbers or not. And that's all we want to look at on the instructions. Let's actually um, start working on the mini tab file. To work on the mini tab file, if you double click on this file that you've downloaded, it's going to give you an error message because um, I'm almost certain I ha um, that you will not have mini tab installed on your computer. I don't have mini tab installed on my computer, I just use it in the web browser. And all of the instructions I'm going to show you today are for the web browser mini tab version, not installing it on your computer because that's an extra step that takes almost as long as the mini tab itself. We're just going to use the web browser. So what we want to do, we don't want to just double click to open. We want to open a new window or a new tab like I have, and we're going to go to app.minitab.com and uh, then in here, once you get here, the first time you get here, which will probably be for all of you right now, the first time you're getting there, you're going to have to log in using your APSU um, email address. And this is not your D2L email address. This is your general APSU email address. Right now, I believe students' extensions are still at my.apsu.edu. 
but eventually um, the school is transitioning to have students just have the at apsu.edu email address. Um, so that's the email that I'm talking about, um, the one outside of D2L. So you'll log in with that email address and uh, your password link should have been emailed to you earlier in the semester. Um, so I like to try to wait until after the drop date or after the last day to add the class so that I'm sure, uh, and that's usually just a few days to a week. Um, so a few days to a week, I will submit for you to be put into Minitab, to have access to Minitab. <clears throat> and then Minitab will email to your Austin P email address um, a link that you can set your password. So if you haven't already set your password, then go ahead and set that now. If you set your password and forgot, or if it, if it says that the link is timed out, what you'll do is you'll click on the forgot password link and that will send you a new email to your Austin P email address so that you can uh, set your password through that. And so once you get logged in, then you'll see something like this. Um, so I've logged in a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, so I definitely have access and it's really nice. Um, and then we want to open our file that we've downloaded. So file, open. Uh, there are several options, but we're always going to open a project. And so we want to open from a local file. What that means is it's stored on your computer, not stored in the cloud. Um, and we're going to save as local files too because students have found it far too confusing to do anything else and this is definitely the simplest option. So we're going to choose local file and then OK. Um, and then if you haven't, um, if you're you know, opening from anywhere else, you probably downloaded to your downloads folder. <coughs> Excuse me. At least that's where I always put my downloads is in the downloads folder. And so we will select the most recent file that we've done. Um, if yours isn't popping up at the top, then you can search um, .mpx and you should see all of the um, .mpx files that you have on your computer and you probably will only have one, um, but I have a whole bunch. Um, that's okay. You will choose the APSU ages. Um, actually, that's an old version. I want the one I just downloaded, so I will go ahead and go back to this one because I want the one I just downloaded. Uh, and then you're given options of what you want to name your file um, and how you want to save it. And let's go ahead and change the name. And I'm going to even erase the replace, replace first 10, although we are going to replace the first 10. And I'm going to name it, um, if it were for me, I would name it Ellen Smith. Um, but you want to use your actual name. So instead of Ellen Smith, lest you think that everybody should put the professor's name here, um, let's name it Jane Doe. And that just allows me to easily see um, who submitted this file. Uh, so Jane Doe, and then I'm going to continue without autosave. Um, and that's what I'm, that's the easiest option. So continue without autosave. Um, I've put my own name here, um, and then OK. And then I also, most importantly, so I can get credit, want to put my own name here too. Um, I'm going to put Jane Doe, but if I were actually doing this assignment for class, I would put my own name, which is Ellen Smith. And uh, so, and then um, we want to replace the first 10 ages. Um, so you will actually go out and survey. Uh, I recommend going to main campus and surveying in front of the library or in front of the UC or somewhere between those two buildings. They're pretty close to each other <clears throat> because that is where you're going to find uh, the most, the best place, the best single convenient location to represent a typical Austin P student. Um, so the majority of our students take classes on campus 
at main campus um, and uh, they all the different majors will be using the library and using the university center um, and so you would replace your ages um, you know let's let's say you find uh, uh, survey someone who's 18 and 25 and 28 and 19 and 23 and so on and so forth um, uh, the, the 51's definitely an outlier um, and uh, so let's say those are your ages um, that's what you would do and then you would run the numbers now you are going to put in the actual ages that you survey um, so you're just going to survey 10 people um, there are already a whole bunch of numbers here you don't have to replace those you only replace the first 10 uh, so uh, the those 10 that had asterisk you're going to replace those um, and then I'm going to show you how we're going to do stuff with the functions. Now I'm switching for the rest of this video to a different file. Um, this is uh, just demonstrating how to use Minitab. Uh, and for this we're using uh, just one set of quantitative data as well. Um, here Kat's own and this is from a former project that students did where they surveyed 30 people. Um, and they ask them a series of questions. One of the questions was, how many cats do you own in your household? And <clears throat> so we're going to use this data, and I'm going to show you basically how Minitab could do all the same functions that your calculator does for this course. Um, and then you'll use these types of functions when you do the individual Minitab project. So you'll go through the individual Minitab project and you'll kind of say, okay, how would I do this in uh, the calculator? And then uh, I'm gonna show you how those calculator functions can all be done inside Minitab. Uh, so if you're looking on your formula card, the um, down the calculator column, the first thing that you'll see your calculator can do for you um, is random integers, but we don't really um, need that in Minitab, so I'm going to skip that part. Um, we do have a lot of graphs, so the second thing you'll see is your stat plot function, and that's going to be all under graphs. Um, so you've got scatter plot, um, histogram, dot plot, uh, even stem and leaf if you wanted to. Uh, the probability plot, which we'll come back to, actually we'll come back to pretty sh pretty soon. Um, but you have a whole bunch of different bar charts and pie charts and all kinds of things that you can do here that you couldn't even do on your calculator. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff that we would never um, use in this course that's advanced statistics beyond what we would do. Uh, so the probability plot, we do have a function like that on the calculator, but we've not used it in this course, but um, it may be quite helpful here. So let's take a look at the probability plot. We'll go ahead and do a simple probability plot um, and then OK. And I'm going to select our data and we're going to do a normal plot because that's usually um, what we are fascinated with in chapters 6, 7, 8, and 9. We're really fascinated with the normal probability distribution. And so, yeah, we want to do normal. And so what it will show here um, is our data values. And these don't look anything like our data values. Um, but we have zero cats owned, and this is how they're distributed. And one cat owned, and this is how they're distributed. And then two and then three, um, and then four um, cats owned. And uh, what we would expect to see if this were normal, um, if this were actually normal, we would expect all of these blue dots to be inside the three red guidelines. Um, so when all of the blue dots are inside the three red guidelines, then we're not sure that it's perfectly normal because they'd all be on the center red line if they, it was perfectly normal. But we think that the data might be approximately normal um, if we have 
inside the three red guidelines. Um, <clears throat> if it's outside of the three red guidelines, uh, then we are relatively sure the data is not normal enough to be doing all of the stuff that we want to be doing. So again, our goal is to look for approximately normal because approximately normal is good enough to do all the stuff that we did in chapter six, seven, eight, and nine. Um, but uh, we do, you know, want to make sure it's at least approximately normal before um, we're really allowed to do that stuff. So that might be handy to assess in here. Uh, and then the next function on your calculator formula card would be one var stats. Um, and that we have something that's even better than one var stats, um, or even more detailed, I guess I should say, under statistics, of course, um, and then basic statistics, and then display descriptive statistics. Uh, I believe that chapter two is even named descriptive statistics, and of course all the chapter two type stuff um, is what we have when we do this. Uh, so for our cat's own data, I would select it, and then I can tell it what statistics and what graphs I wanna do. And for this, what I would do um, is I would go back and I would read all of the instructions. This is the absolute best way to do that. And to see, okay, what kind of graphs do I need? Um, what kind of statistics do I need? Um, and here's some more statistics. And, and this might even be another statistic that I could do. So I would go through this entire list and say, okay, what kind of descriptive statistics or graphs do I need? And then I would go back here, and when I click statistics, I would say, oh, I didn't need this one, or I didn't need this one, um, but I need this one, or I need this one, or I need this one. So I would check and uncheck all of the relevant different things that are from your instructions. Um, and then once you have checked and unchecked everything, you can click OK. And then graphs, I would say, OK, which of these graphs did I need? And I would check all of the graphs that I needed. Um, and I'm just going to check one of them. Uh, and then I would select OK. And then I would check OK. Uh, and then hopefully in this list, now it, um, sometimes it's like you have to scroll to see it all. Uh, but I believe this is everything here. I didn't have a lot selected. I thought I had more than that selected. But I guess that's that's good. This is the five number summary here. Min, Q1, median, Q3, and the max. Um, and then I have my mean and my standard deviation. Uh, and the number of data values. I have 30, but your number of data values will be different. So. Um, if I scroll down and give it time to refresh, I can see that I do have, in fact, 30 data values. Um, and then I have uh, my individual dot plot that has dots for zero and dots for one and dots for two um, and dots for three and a dot for four, a single dot for four. <clears throat> uh, the next thing that I want to talk about actually isn't one of the calculator functions, but it is something that's either in chapter one or chapter two, I can't remember which actually. Um, and uh, your calculator can't do this, but Minitab can. So that's, it, Minitab can do a lot th a lot of things faster. Like this is, this is a lot faster than you could do on the calculator because you would have to do a whole bunch of different things to get here and all these graphs. Um, so the mini tab is good. And if we had a whole bunch of different variables, it would do all of the variables at once as well. Um, so the frequency table uh, is what we want to do next. And really, this isn't exactly a frequency table. It's called tallies. Um, and it's under stat as well and tables. And we want to tally individual variables. And so I'll just select our variable that we have. Um, and this is sort of like a frequency table. Um, here, because I don't have any holes in my data, um, it really does match a frequency table perfectly. But it could have been that I had zero P1 
people, um, zero households who had exactly two cats. And in that case, what this data would have done is it would have said zero, one, three, four, and it would have left a, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have put a two, zero there. And so technically a frequency table should tell you where the holes are, and this one would not if there were holes in your data. Um, fortunately, there aren't any holes in our data, so it gives us exactly what a frequency table would be for this data. Uh, this is probably not going to be directly useful, but it might be indirectly useful for instead of counting all of the, the people who are a certain age or less, for instance, uh, you could just do the tally and it would tell you. So you may not end up copying and pasting this into Word, but it's, it's going to save you some time in some of your calculations, perhaps. <clears throat> uh, and then um, there, there is some stuff with a discrete random variable that we won't touch on because really the discrete random variable is talking about uh, variable values and their corresponding probabilities. We don't really have anything like that with our one quantitative data set. Um, so we'll skip the, the calculator discrete random variable stuff. But then the next thing that we have is binomial PDF and CDF. And then shortly after that, we have normal CDF and inverse norm. And all of these functions are kind of found together under the calculate menu. So calculate and then probability distributions. And these three functions will do binom PDF, binom CDF, inverse norm, normal CDF. Um, all, all of those things can be found under here. Um, PDF actually stands for probability uh, density function and CDF actually stands for cumulative distribution function and inverse norm is really the inverse of the cumulative distribution function. Um, so uh, this is your CDF, this is your PDF, and this is your inverse. Let's uh, do, let's do binom PDF first. Actually, let's just go ahead and do them in order. Uh, so we'll do a cumulative distribution function. Let's take a look at it. Um, and so we're going to leave this as a single value each time instead of doing columns. It's simpler that way. Uh, we have our input of our mean and our standard deviation, but if you remember, um, so this is our CDF, like normal CDF or binome CDF. Um, we're doing normal right now because it says normal. So normal CDF took in the minimum uh, data value, the maximum data value, um, and then the mean and the standard deviation. So we have our mean and our standard deviation here. This value is going to be your maximum value. And then by default, it's automatically going to use as the minimum value negative infinity. So essentially, this is only going to do the area that's to the left of your value. Um, so in this scenario, let's suppose that we want um, to find uh, the, the probability of um, being less than 1. And our mean is 1.0. 033 for number of cats owned per household and our standard deviation is 1.245 and so we want to find the values less than one um, our mean of our our cats owned data um, is and this is the number of cats owned per household on average um, 1.033 and 1.245 and I got that from my descriptive statistics by the way uh, and so we look at being less than or equal to one, the probability of being less than or equal to one. Well, that's a really high percentage. I didn't, I mean, if you convert it to percentage, that would be 48.9%. I didn't realize it was going to be quite that high. Um, so almost half of our data values are going to be less than or equal to one. 
Um, and again, the where I got the 1.033 is from our descriptive statistics and also the standard deviation of the 1.245 was from our descriptive statistics. And I just made up the less than one part. But what you'll do is you'll look at your instructions from the individual mini tab assignment and that will determine what you're going to put in here. Um, let's do the other two functions as well. So probability distribution inverse norm. Um, let's suppose that we want to know 90% um, um, what 90% 90, 90 of the data is below. Now this time it's still doing area to the left um, but you put in you put in right here what is your area to the left. So in this way the inverse norm function is almost identical. It uses the same three inputs. Um, we will also do 1.033 and 1.245 for the mean and the standard deviation. Um, but if we want our area to the left to be 0 0.90 or 90%, um, that's what we'll put there. And then what it says is the probability of being less than or equal to 0 0.9 that's going to be somebody who's owning um, or on average owning 2.63 cats or, or whatever. Um, so that is going to be the data value that is 90% um, of the households will be below and 10% of the households will be above. Uh, so that's the inverse norm. Um, for both of these we have used the normal distribution instead of the binomial distribution. Um, essentially they're going to work the same way. Of course the CDF function will do that number or fewer, that x value or fewer, um, whereas binomial PDF would do uh, exactly that number. We're going to go ahead and just do binomial PDF. Um, and then the default is normal, uh, but to get to binomial, we would select this menu and look at how many options that we have here. Um, the only two that we've really done on these probability distribution functions are the normal distribution and the binomial distribution. Um, but you have all of these. Some basic statistics courses do chi-square, um, but I haven't seen uh, statistics courses do any of these other distributions. Um, and so we'll select binomial and when we select binomial to do binomial PDF or binomial CDF, um, we'll get the number of trials and the event probability. So our number of trials, we had 30 data values that we collected. Um, so n, this is n and this is p and this is like our x. Um, so our n is 30. And then we will say hypothetically that we are told that the probability of um, not owning a cat is one half for the entire uh, population. So uh, 0 0.5 um, for all U.S. households. Um, so uh, we had 14 people indicate uh, that they did not own a cat. So our value here um, our x, in other words, would be 14. Uh, and so this is binome PDF because we're doing the PD instead of the CD with n as 30, our p is 0.5, and our x is 14. And when we do that, um, it tells us what that probability is. So, um, and we would do the cumulative distribution function with binomial the same way if we wanted to. Uh, get the cumulative of 14 or less um, people owning when we surveyed 30. Um, and that's a pretty small number, uh, but again, you know, it's not that small because we could have had anywhere from 0 to 30. Um, the probability that it's exactly 14 uh, is 13.5%. So it's, it's not an unusual number that um, is very different from what we would expect. Uh, and then the next big thing that we want to talk about are 
um, that we do on our calculator. And really kind of the last big thing that we'll talk about um, because we aren't able to get as far as linear regression on here uh, is our intervals and our tests. So under stat um, basic statistics we have our confidence intervals and hypothesis tests. And you'll see that we have a whole bunch of stuff that we didn't cover um, in the course and that even our calculator doesn't cover. So on the calculator we do have um, the several of these functions. The one sample Z, we just call it the Z test. Um, and it is option one. Uh, also under the here is the Z interval. Um, so we can select this and then we select either test or interval. Let me show you that. Um, so if we want to perform a test, we select this button. But if we leave it unchecked, then it's going to do an interval for us. So all of these functions will do either the test or the interval. Um, so we have the one sample Z, which is the same as our Z test option one. Um, and it's also the same as our Z interval, which is option seven. And then we have the one sample T, which is the same thing as our T test, which is option two, um, or the same thing as our T interval, which is option eight. We do have on our calculator the two sample T test and interval, but we don't actually use them, so we'll skip that. We don't have the paired T. Um, we do have one proportions and two proportions, but we only ever use one proportion. This is the same as the one prop Z test and the one prop Z end. Uh, so let's go ahead and do, um, let's say a T test. We would do a Z test if we knew the population standard deviation sigma, but um, let's suppose we're not given that for the cats. Nobody told us what the standard deviation of all of the cat ownership per household was, so we'll go ahead and use one sample T. Uh, we will go ahead and stay with uh, the default one or more samples in each column, and then we'll click inside this box to be able to select our variable. And really, we only have one variable, so it's not going to be complicated about which variable to select. Now, if I hit OK here, it would do the confidence interval, but I actually want to perform a hypothesis test. And my hypothesis is that the mean number of cats whole, um, owned per household is actually less than one. I'm probably going to be wrong about this one, but that's what we're going to do. The mean is less than one. Um, so uh, I want to select on, that. what I just did is selected options. Um, I want to select less than. Now I could have selected less than, not equal to, or more than. You will select based on what the actual instructions ask you to do for the ages. So I'm going to select less than. Um, and then, if I wanted to do a graph with it, I could. Uh, we already did graphs with our descriptive statistics, or could have done graphs with our descriptive statistics. So you may or may not want to do a graph here. Uh, and then I'll select OK. And uh, it didn't give me the confidence interval. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But it did give me the hypothesis test. Here's my, my T-score and my p-value, and you can see my p-value is really high. Um, and so that's how we would do a t-test on Minitab, uh, and then we would go back into that same area if we wanted to do proportions. Um, I'm going to do a proportions interval since we did a t-test um, by not checking the perform hypothesis test box. Um, and actually on proportions, it's easier to do summarized data. Um, and that's usually how we're approaching it on the calculator too, because then it will prompt us for our x and our n. Our x um, the number is the number of events. So that's like go through and count how many um, cats that you have in a particular category. Uh, we're going to stick with that theme of zero, um, how many people own zero cats. And when I did my tally, I saw that there were 14 people who owned zero cats. 
And then my number of trials, I have 30 people that I surveyed in total. So my N or my sample size is 30. Um, and 14 of those owning zero cats. And I'm going to do a confidence interval. So this is all I have to do. And it'll give me the confidence interval of the people in the whole population who own no cats. So between 28.3% and 65.7% of all, whatever my whole population is, U.S. citizens, um, would not own a cat, own zero cats. Um, so that's how you would do the uh, confidence interval for proportions. Uh, if I wanted to do the confidence interval for quantitative data, um, let's go back to this and uncheck. Um, let's see if it'll give me a confidence interval now. Hmm, it still didn't really give the confidence interval. Let's erase that and see. Ah, and let's go ahead and make that not equal to. So we've made it just like the default options. Okay, if we make it just like the default options, it will actually give us our confidence interval. Um, so that's good. Uh, if you have extra stuff that really just doesn't work, you can right click on it and delete it. Um, you can't move these around though, um, or at least there's no way I've found that you can move these around, but you can delete functions if you did the wrong thing. You can just right click on them and delete like I did. Uh, let's see. Oh, let me show you that there are actually 14 zeros. So um, there are actually 14 zeros. Um, and that's really kind of all of the basic functions that we'll, we would use. Uh, there are regression things, um, and so if you were asked to do regression, you could do uh, a fitted line plot, um, and, but you really need two variables for that, as you can see right here, um, and we just aren't going to get to that. Um, number one, it was the last chapter in our course, and so um, that's one of the reasons, but another reason, of course, is that it uses two variables instead of one variable and we're just working with the ages in this. So we're just kind of doing the simplest part of Minitab. But that is all of the, the major functions that you will need to complete the individual Minitab assignment. I'm not going to tell you which ones go with which numbers. I'm going to let you figure that out. But I will and have told you um, that uh, this uh, probability plot is not something we've done in the course. Um, yet, but it can tell you probability, and I told you how. Um, this descriptive stats was like one bar stats, so anytime you would need um, those kinds of statistics or uh, graphs, you can use descriptive stats. Um, the tally was much like our frequency table, um, and then uh, CDF, normal CDF, inverse norm, um, and then this was binome PDF, but you could also do binome CDF, uh, and then your confidence intervals and hypotheses test. Um, and that's, that's really all that you need. The last thing, though, is that you want to save this. Um, so you definitely don't want to have any errors while you're doing all this stuff, um, and you don't want your computer to crash while you're doing all this stuff. And you can intermittently, if you want to, download a copy, um, and it will download your most recent copy. So I'm going to download a copy. Um, and you see that it's named minitabdemo.mpx. Now, mpx is very important because when we go back to our minitab folder, um, this should be the minitab file, um, and you will want to submit um, your .mpx file. Um, and that that's really saying that this extension here should say .mpx. And that's what we'll do right now, if I can if I can. Uh, so as faculty, it might not let me, but I'm hoping it will. Um, hmm. We'll just, oh yeah, click on the upload and it'll bring me a window. So I've named my file Minitab Demo here. 
the cat file. I guess I should have named it Mini Tab Cats. Um, and so we'll upload the cat file and add, and I'll just call it the cat file. And submit. And it says file submission successful. Um, and it says confirmation email sent. But I don't have an email tick box, but I bet when I click on anything else, I will have um, an email. Yes, so it shows me um, that I have an email um, from D2L to, uh, to get confirmation. Um, and it also shows me that I have submitted one file and I can even click on it and see what my submission is. Now, you can't just click on this and have it open. You'd have to click on it and download it and then go to mini tab and open it um, just to confirm that it's the correct file that you wanted. Uh, but that's, that's how we do mini tab.